Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Mazza. I'm a research fellow here at AEI. Um, thanks for coming out on this sort of gross spring morning. Um, you know, when we started thinking about this event, it was a couple months ago during the uh, anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act. And, and we originally wanted to do an event asking whether or not the TRA still mattered, whether it was relevant, uh, whether it needed to be updated or, or jettisoned. Um, and we decided to ask a more fundamental question, which is whether or not uh, Taiwan matters anymore. Um, is it as important to the United States as it once was, um, given seemingly greater challenges elsewhere in the region, um, given China's uh, growing influence, um, and, and um, a general, I think, um, lowering interest here in, in, in the island? Um, and so that's what we're going to address today. We're going to have sort of two approaches to this question. Um, Jim and Derek are going to talk about whether the island matters, whether it should matter from, I think, a, a little bit of a, a um, higher altitude. Jim's going to talk about the region's geography and the, and the place of the island in it, and, and Derek's going to talk about the economics of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. Uh, and then we've asked Julie and Abe to give their assessments um, on the administration's Taiwan policy. Does Taiwan matter to this administration? How important is it? How does the administration prioritize that relationship? Um, and so we're just going to go ahead and get started. I want to prattle on. You have the bios, so I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Um, Jim Thomas, to my right, is Vice President and Director of Studies at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Derek Scissors is a resident scholar here at AAI. Uh, Julia is a research affiliate at the Project 2049 Institute. And Abe Denmark is Vice President for Political and Security Affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Uh, we're just going to go right down the line and get it started with Jim. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks, thanks Michael, for your, your introduction and, and to AEI for hosting today's event. Um, Michael asked me to start by talking about the, the geostrategic significance of Taiwan. And uh, as I was talking with some of my colleagues at CSBA, uh, we were all in agreement that, that the critical thing this morning was to ever avoid uh, at all costs the phrase cork in the bottle uh, when, describing, when describing Taiwan. The truth is, is that um, Taiwan really is geostrategically important, as I'll explain. Um, and what I want to do this morning is hit uh, three points in my remarks. I want to talk about Taiwan and the rebalance uh, that, that's ongoing. Um, Taiwan and the, the American uh, grand strategic debate, and lastly, how uh, I think a long-term competition with China might actually intensify if, if Taiwan were, were reunified. So let me start with Taiwan and the rebalance. It's very strange that in the discussion of, of the Asia-Pacific rebalance over the last several years and the pivot uh, and the so-called Asian century, that Taiwan has been uh, strangely absent uh, from the discussion. I think this is both good and bad. Uh, it's obviously good in the sense that cross-strait relations have improved uh, over the last several years, and, and uh, uh, there's been, um, in particular, uh, a growth in, in cross-strait trade uh, and uh, political um, contacts. But I think it's also bad in, in, in the sense that the fundamental, the fundamental underlying tensions between uh, Taiwan and the mainland have not abated, uh, nor uh, has, has uh, the mainland China changed its stance uh, when it comes to uh, dropping its threat to use force if necessary to reunify Taiwan. Um, and at the same time, the, the military situation is badly deteriorated. Uh, China, as is, is, uh, Michael notes in a, in a recent report, um, and, it, and it's widely recognized, um, has experienced double-digit growth uh, in, its, in its defense spending uh, over uh, the last 15 or more years. And at the same time, uh, defense budgets have remained rather stagnant uh, on, the, on the part of Taiwan itself, uh, contributing to a growing imbalance. Taiwan is still wrestling with uh, trying to establish an all-volunteer force in its military uh, and struggles with modernization, not only from a, from a, a budgetary standpoint, but also an, an, an availability of, of, of imported arms uh, from, from abroad. Um, all of these... Uh, all of these conditions have, have led to uh, a, a bad deterioration in the balance uh, in terms of Taiwan's susceptibility to uh, coercive missile bombardment, uh, to a blockade, 
and, and over the next several years, um, e even to the threat of invasion itself. Beyond just thinking in terms of the rebalance, though, um, Taiwan also has um, uh, entered the, the American grand strategic debate uh, in, in, a, in a very strange way. Um, it is increasingly caught up in an academic argument between those who favor forward, uh, deep engagement uh, and those of more declinist orientation, <coughs> orientation who favor offshore balancing. Offshore, balance, offshore balancers increasingly uh, call for abandoning Taiwan, which they see as a dangerous strategic liability uh, that could draw the United States into a war with another nuclear power, where uh, that, that power's perceived stakes may be greater than our own. For many in this offshore balancing school, writing off Taiwan would serve to lessen the strategic competition uh, between China and the United States and improve the regional security situation. However, I think that China's aggressive behavior towards its maritime neighbors over the last several years should lead us to question that thesis. Indeed, it is unlikely that sacrificing Taiwan would satisfy China. And this really leads me to, uh, to, my, to my last point, which is thinking about Taiwan in a long-term strategic competition. Um, it's not just that uh, uh, abandoning Taiwan uh, would not improve the, the, the strategic competition or, or, or less intentions. Um, I would argue that it's, it's even worse, that um, the unification of Taiwan, uh, especially by force uh, with the mainland, would lead to a sharp intensification and multilateralization of the strategic competition. And this is where the geostrategy really comes in and thinking about the geography of Taiwan. Because indeed, Taiwan really is a zero-sum prize. Its status today beyond the yoke of Chinese military power is a geostrategic advantage to the United States and its allies, and is a geostrategic constraint on China's ability to project power uh, regionally. The PLA's lack of control over the island means that its access to the open sea is limited. It must navigate through straits controlled by either Japan or the Philippines. And in conflict, those choke points would be extremely dangerous for hostile ships or submarines as allied forces could concentrate their defenses around them. Indeed, Taiwan is arguably one of the greatest constraints on Chinese naval uh, power projection. The flip side of this is that unification would worsen the strategic position of the United States, and most importantly, it would worsen the situation uh, the security position, particularly of its allies, in a long-term competition with China. It would allow China to expand its military envelope eastward, uh, deploying both sensors as well as uh, offensive weapon systems uh, on, on the island uh, to, to push out uh, beyond the first island chain. And it would also enable the, the PLA Navy to gain direct access to the open and deep waters of the Pacific. Removing the Taiwan problem, moreover, would allow the PLA to transform its defense planning and intensify pressure on maritime neighbors uh, in both the East and South China Seas over territorial disputes. And it would allow the PLA to accelerate the development of longer term, or I'm sorry, longer range power projection capabilities to secure China's lines of communication and challenge American interests farther afield. And finally, it would remove a, a critical geographic buffer between China and Japan, thereby making uh, direct clashes uh, between these historic rivals more likely, while freeing up Beijing to focus more efforts on uh, rupturing the Japan-US alliance. For all of these reasons, I believe the United States has an enduring interest in opposing any unilateral effort to change the status quo. Far from destabilizing, today's security situation in, A in Asia or aggravating Sino-American tensions. Taiwan's current status serves as a break on the acceleration, intensification, and multilateralization of what is likely to be a long-term strategic great power competition. Therefore, it is not only in the U.S. interest, but in the interests of allies and friends in the region to support efforts aimed at preserving the security balance in the region, as well as Taiwan's status itself. Thank you. So on the econ side, uh, the upshot is that, that yes, Taiwan still matters, but its importance is increasingly fragile. Um, you usually start off these talks by listing these facts about Taiwan's trade numbers and economic size, and I'm sick of doing that, so I'm not doing it anymore. Um, Taiwan punches above its population size and economically, and even above that in trade. It remains a top U.S. trade partner despite having 23 million people stipulated. 
The question is where it's going, and here the answer is much less reassuring. For example, bilateral trade volume between the U.S. and Taiwan was smaller in 2013 than it was in 2007. Um, that's not conclusive, it's just an illustration. So now that I'm not going to talk about the, the, the happy facts that people use to reassure themselves about Taiwan, I'll talk about some unpleasant reminders. Taiwan not only has a small population, it has no resources other than its location, which Jim has just talked about. This is, the location is remembered in security, but the lack of resources seems to be forgotten in economics. People over 65 are 11 percent of the population, um, over 11 percent of the population now. Uh, they're more capable than people over 65 were 25 years ago, but they're not capable of working in manufacturing. Population will start falling about 2025. Taiwan's location is deteriorating as an asset. Uh, dyna economic dynamism, dynamism on the mainland is fading, inevitably, either quickly or slowly, uh, and the possibility of military conflict appears to be rising. So Taiwan on the econ side has almost nothing to offer. I, I, people just don't want to hear that. Too bad. It's true. What matters is policy. Policy is everything. The, when you don't have the resources, you're not Saudi Arabia, you're not the United States. Um, you need to have the, the right policies. Uh, and what matters to the U.S. is not just, it matters U.S. Taiwan, Taiwan's policies toward the U.S. matter, but what matters to the U.S. because the U.S. is the is a global economic actor and still remains the custodian of the international economic order is Taiwan's global footprint. Taiwan is important in the global economy. That means the U.S. is going to care about Taiwan a lot more. So what policies does Taiwan, has Taiwan followed and does it need to follow to maintain its importance in the global economy? Um, well, it needs to do a lot better. Uh, the rise of Japan boosted Taiwan's economy for about three decades, and the rise of China did it for about three more decades. Counting on China for another decade of, of rapid expansion is risky. Counting on it for three more is crazy. China's labor force is uh, already starting to shrink, probably, with data is not that good. It certainly will start to shrink in the next decade. It is massively in debt. It's not vulnerable to a debt crisis because it's a non-commercial financial system, but the debt shows that the economy doesn't work anymore. And that's what you do when your economy doesn't work. You accumulate debt. That's what the Chinese are doing. Um, Taiwan, because Taiwan is so small, it needs a partner or partners to maintain its prosperity or hopefully to increase it. That means it has to be extremely aggressive in finding these partners in trade and investment. Japan was brought to Taiwan as a success by the United States, not anything Taiwan did. China's reform made, made the mainland a partner for Taiwan, not anything Taiwan did. Taiwan responded effectively to these things, didn't initiate anything. Name the candidate here for Taiwan to, 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 to just have to fall into Taiwan's lap. Taiwan has to go out and find these people. The free trade agreement dam has been broken with the Singapore and New Zealand agreements. Obviously, Singapore and New Zealand are not going to transform the Taiwanese economy, but they weren't, those agreements weren't signed for, for, their, for themselves alone. They were signed to start the ball rolling elsewhere. There are plenty of countries who would be happy to sign agreements with Taiwan without going through Beijing for the opportunity to snub the mainland. Um, Taiwan has to look past the short-term negotiation of these things and think of their long-term prosperity. The only way Taiwan is going to maintain its prosperity is to find new partners to substitute for first Japan and then China. India would be big enough, but I would not suggest that you rely on India. As a developing economy, India's agricultural productivity may be falling. Um, that is a horrible sign for India's development. Hopefully that will turn around in the near future, but it hasn't yet. You could combine Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, small con smaller countries in Asia, all of which are looking for some way to balance China now, and economic agreements with Taiwan might do that. But the initiative has to come from Taiwan because Taiwan needs these agreements more than any of its partners. So what's the, what's the thing I haven't mentioned yet, which is obvious when you're talking about how Taiwan can maintain its prosperity by, by seeking much more aggressively uh, new foreign partners and therefore maintain its importance in the global economy and to the U.S. The obvious uh, elephant in the room is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is another opportunity that is largely outside of Taiwan's control. Um, behind the rise of Japan, the rise of China, Taiwan's own prosperity is an American-led system um, which has enabled the massive expansion of trade in East Asia. The new wrinkle in that system is, is TPP, which we're actually talking about tomorrow here. 
but the outcomes of TPP are not, not subject to Taiwan's determination. It could be a step in transforming the system in expanding trade and investment ties, uh, followed by TTIP, the Transatlantic Partnership, WTO gets sidelined, we have a new world economic order starting with TPP, or it could be nothing. Right now it's kind of looking like it's gonna be nothing, but things change quickly in American politics. If the TPP fails, if it's not transformative, it just, you know, if there is a TPP and it means nothing or there is no TPP, Taiwan is left hoping China will reform again, maybe, hoping India will get its act together, or in need of soliciting a lot of other economic partners, and I've, I've named the ones in East Asia, there are also ones in, in South America. If the TPP succeeds and Taiwan is part of it early on, the problem is largely solved. Hooray. Now Taiwan has a new set of partners to talk to. Uh, the TPP, if it's successful, will expand to almost any dynamic Asian country. Um, it will meet standards that will be used in the transatlantic partnership, which means Taiwan's access to Europe will eventually be increased. And it will set the standards for a new American-led global economic order, and Taiwan will be part of it right from the beginning. So this negative view I have of, of Taiwan's fundamentals and its policy direction is solved if you get a successful TPP, which Taiwan cannot control, and if Taiwan is a part of TPP early. Um, if, Taiwan, if you get a successful TPP and Taiwan is not a part of TPP early, Taiwan is set for long-term economic stagnation and there's no way around it. If you have Korea, which can join TPP at will, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, and Mexico in TPP, you don't need Taiwan. Nobody needs Taiwan in that scenario. Nobody. Not the United States, not Singapore, which has an FTA with Taiwan, not New Zealand, no one. So at that point, the interest is all if TPP is successful. Again, TPP being unsuccessful isn't good for Taiwan either. But if TPP is successful and Taiwan's part of it, not part of it, all the interest moves away from Taiwan. And joining late, meaning you know the original Ma statement of we'll join TPP in 10 years, which of course is closer now because TPP never actually gets finished, uh, and then eight years and so on. Joining late is the same. Supply chains don't shift like this, but they do shift. And the electronic supply chain, if Taiwan joins, let's say in, if TPP actually passes next year and Taiwan joins in 2021, and I just made that date up, but just as an illustration, the su electronic supply chain will leave Taiwan and it won't come back. Because why should it? What does Taiwan have to offer except better policies than all these other countries? And if they're willing to be more aggressive about joining TPP than Taiwan, Taiwan doesn't have better policies. So we have a, you know, the conclusion here is very straightforward. Taiwan's is still important on the global stage, still important to the US, both by, you can just see that in the stats that I'm tired of talking about. Um, but that importance is obviously vulnerable. We've seen the Taiwan share of US trade uh, decline. We've seen dynamism in the mainland economy, which has been driving Taiwan's economy, also decline. The solutions are fairly straightforward economically. They may be very hard politically, but that's only because we have politicians who lack nerve, which we have in the US, by the way. Um, prep to join Trans-Pacific Partnership as soon as possible. Get ahead of the curve on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Don't get in line behind the Philippines and Korea. That's a mistake. Um, you can't control whether the Trans-Pacific Partnership is successful. So at the same time, reach out independently on a bilateral basis to Indonesia, to Brazil, and so on. And if Taiwan is behind the curve and thinks China will save it or the US will save it, that's taking a very big gamble. Well, thank you so much to AEI and particularly Mike for having me today. Uh, I'm supposed to talk more about Obama administration policy and I'm sure whatever I don't have time to get to, Abe will take care of. Um, and like Derek, I'm not gonna spend too much time on stats, just big picture. So although a productive partnership with Taiwan is critical to the success of our strategic goals in the Asia Pacific region, in reality, our relationship with Taiwan has suffered from benign neglect for far too long. The Obama administration can reinvigorate the US-Taiwan bilateral relationship by focusing on five concrete areas of engagement. It should work directly with Taiwan to actively promote peace and stability in Asia, 
uh, as Derek's mentioned, uh, looking at ways to strengthen bilateral economic and trade ties, uh, preserving democracy, human rights, and media freedom, reopening block channels of communication, and facilitating meaningful participation in international organizations. Uh, first of all, as, as Jim mentioned, safeguarding peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region is absolutely vital to U.S. core national interests. Uh, China's unprecedented military modernization over the past two decades has created an, a dangerous imbalance across the Taiwan Strait. In accordance with the TRA, the United States should maintain regular and appropriate arms sales to help bolster the capacity of Taiwan to defend itself against potential military threats. The Obama administration in particular should authorize the sale of increasingly advanced weapons platforms to assist Taiwan in maintaining its defense capability. Uh, we cannot hope to successfully implement our Asian rebalancing policy unless Taiwan maintains the capacity to defend its sovereignty and as a partner in the U.S. regional security architecture. Our leaders in Washington must therefore engage in a more robust, transparent, and honest dialogue with their counterparts in Taipei regarding how to best counter military threats in, from Beijing. Uh, as Mike has pointed out, dialogue should focus not simply on Taiwan's homeland defense mission, but also Taiwan's ability to field a force that can counter China across the spectrum of coercive scenarios and in all domains, albeit with asymmetric means whenever possible. At the same time, U.S. defense planners should do more to incorporate Taiwan into our rebalancing efforts, thereby publicly recognizing areas in which we can promote joint cooperation between our two countries. Working together to address cybersecurity issues, the A2-AV threat, and other regional security ca challenges can benefit all of our partners and allies. Second, the Obama administration should take further steps to strengthen the U.S.-Taiwan economic and trade relationship. As Derek already articulated, uh, Taiwan is a valuable economic partner of the United States, although there are some problems. Uh, our two countries recently concluded the eighth Trade and Investment Framework Agreement Council meeting, which is certainly a welcome development following the resumptions of talks last year. It is consequentially essential that we not only work towards a bilateral investment agreement, but also actively support Taiwan's ascension to the TPP as a round two candidate. Diversification represents the key to Taiwan's future growth and is necessary to sy hedge against systemic risk from China. Third, the Obama administration should speak out far more frequently on the importance of preserving democracy, human rights, and media freedom in Taiwan. The United States played an instrumental role in Taiwan's peaceful transition from an authoritarian regime into a democracy. There are indications, however, that Taiwan is being pressured into backtracking on civil rights and liberties for the purpose of improving cross-strait relations. The United States can take steps to ensure that our leaders fully appreciate and also appropriately react to pressures faced by civil society actors in Taiwan. CODELs and other officials visiting Taiwan should consider proactively requesting meetings with opposition parties, NGOs, and civil society groups throughout the country. The American Institute in Taiwan could help facilitate such meetings. The Obama administration may also wish to consider sending a high-level official from the State Department Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor to promote dialogue and learn more about recent large-scale protests, such as the anti-media monopoly and sunflower movements. Although Taiwan's democracy has made great strides since martial law was lifted in 1987, the United States should still speak out whenever it can to facilitate the further deepening and consolidation of Taiwan's democracy. Fourth, the administration should reopen block channels of communication with Taiwan officials. The United States should encourage visits by cabinet level officials between Washington and Taipei to foster commercial, technological, and people to people exchanges. The U.S. government should also lift restrictions on visit by senior Taiwanese officials to the United States. Um, let's see, uh, per, okay, permit value our meetings, uh, and allow senior officials of the Departments of State and Defense to travel to Taiwan on official business. 
Engaging in such measures will promote clearer and more direct communication between leaders in the United States and Taiwan. And finally, we need to do far more to facilitate Taiwan's meaningful participation in international organizations. Taiwan's democratic experience, scientific and technological expertise, world-class healthcare system, and humanitarian assistance have made valuable contributions to people around the world. If Taiwan's voice is extinguished in the international community, the United States will lose an essential democratic, economic, and security partner. It is therefore in the U.S. interest to expand Taiwan's international space by facilitating Taiwan's participation as a member or observer in existing international organizations such as the United Nations, TPP, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Although some progress was made last year regarding Taiwanese participation in the ICAO, China insisted that Taiwan participate as a guest at the 38th ICAO assembly. The United States had hoped that Taiwan could participate in as observer. Ad hoc invitations from China that require annual approval set a poor precedent for consistent, meaningful Taiwanese participation. I wholeheartedly suggest Bonnie Glazer's suggestion that the United States should work with other nations to revise or amend the charters or rules of membership for key international organizations so that Taiwan can join in some capacity without raising sovereignty matters. Legal obstacles to Taiwan's expanded participation can thereby be removed or gain some official Oops, sorry, or, and opportunities can be created for non-sovereign entities to become observers or gain some official standing. This would not fully resolve the issue of Taiwan's international space, but it would be a helpful interim measure that would enable Taiwan to increase its participation while its international status remains ambiguous. By intentionally restricting Taiwan's meaningful participation in international organizations, China limits Taiwan's contributions and also, as a side effect, risks damaging cross-strait relations. The United States should take concrete measures to counteract the effects of diplomatic isolation by expanding Taiwan's participation in a wide range of organizations. These five areas of bilateral engagement all represent excellent opportunities for the Obama administration. The U.S.-Taiwan relationship is not merely one that we must manage effectively in order to strengthen bilateral ties with the People's Republic of China. Crafting a robust, healthy, and stable long-term Taiwan policy represents the active participation of knowledgeable Taiwan hands, not simply knowledgeable China hands. If we wish to fully incorporate Taiwan into our Asian rebalancing policy, then we need a more robust and nuanced understanding of the political, economic, social, and security dynamics shaping contemporary Taiwan. The relationship between Taipei and Washington rests on a solid foundation, yet we must lack neither the conviction nor the vision necessary to pursue a transparent and strategic long-term bilateral relationship, one that recognizes our shared values and mutual stake in promoting a peaceful and prosperous Asia-Pacific region. Thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks to AEI for hosting such an important uh, topic and inviting me to speak on it. Um, in Washington, especially uh, these days, uh, finding areas of bipartisan agreement is especially uh, and increasingly difficult. And I think that we're somewhat uh, blessed or somewhat uh, benefited by the fact that uh, U.S. policy towards Asia generally, and I think towards Taiwan specifically, is an area of uh, fairly deep and broad agreement um, across the general the political spectrum in the United States. So, um, one of the nice uh, one of the nice aspects of talking about U.S. policy towards Taiwan um, is that we don't have to worry about um, partisan finger pointing and and bickering, and really just focus on the fundamentals of American policy and relations with Taiwan, um, in part because of the remarkable continuity that, that I think you can see across administrations, across parties, um, on U.S. policies uh, and strategies towards Taiwan, um, in which there really hasn't been significant structural changes, administration to administration, but rather a fairly co uh, continuous um, approach of engagement. 
And I think that in the Obama administration, uh, what I've seen at least, is fairly robust engagement with Taiwan across a wide variety of issues. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today, and since uh, so many of these issues have already been covered, I'll try to be a bit brief, um, is to, to um, explain how I see um, the fairly robust engagement by the Obama administration across several issues, um, but focus a bit, uh, maybe to help inform the discussion afterwards, I'll talk a bit about where I, I would like to see the relationship move in the future. A few recommendations on that point. So looking at the Obama administration's uh, engagement with Taiwan, I think you can see it's fairly robust across three different areas. Uh, the first and most talked about, at least in, in my circles, is being arms sales. Uh, the Obama administration has notified Congress of over $12 billion of arms sales to Taiwan, um, including um, advanced, uh, advanced upgrades to uh, the F F-16 forces um, and other capabilities. Um, a fairly large number, uh, although it's been fairly uh, concentrated in uh, several, into small, large um, notifications rather than several smaller ones. Um, on the political side, uh, there's been regular meetings um, between the two sides in, in the unofficial capacity of the relationship. Um, the, the U.S. sent a cabinet-level official earlier this year, the uh, administrator for the EPA, uh, the highest level representative that the United States has sent to Taiwan since the Clinton administration in 2000. Um, so very important signal there. Um, and the United States has been more vocal in promoting Taiwan's uh, international space and, pr and promoting its meaningful participation in, in uh, international organizations, most, uh, most obvious, most recent being Taiwan's uh, participation in the International Civil Aviation Organization. Um, and finally, on the trade aspect, there's been some very important progress on the trade relationship in recent years, um, where TIFA talks were resumed after a six-year hiatus. Um, they had not met um, between 2007 and 2013, and there have already been two meetings of TIFA um, in 2013 um, and, and later on. Um, and we're making progress, from what I've seen, on the bilateral investment agreement, and the United States has been very encouraging of, of Taiwan uh, to make progress towards joining TPP. Now, I'm, on TPP, I very much agree with uh, Derek that uh, Taiwan joining P TPP would be incredibly beneficial um, to Taiwan, um, both because of its need to diversify its economic relationships, um, but also because of the needed structural reforms that it would need to, to do in order to join TPP would, I think, be very beneficial to Taiwan's economy in themselves. So across those areas, I think you see some very robust engagement across, across the issues from the Obama administration. Um, looking ahead, I would like to see, actually, I think everyone would agree um, that there could, there's more that could be done. Um, and I'd like to few, uh, throw a few things out there. Um, Bonnie's recommendation that was mentioned before um, for the United States to advocate uh, for Taiwan to get more international space, I think, is a very good one. Um, and I would also endorse Bonnie's recommendations. Um, more regular arms sales, I think, is very important. The uh, House recently passed uh, a bill for the U.S. to provide Taiwan with four Perry class missile, uh, guided missile destroyers, um, which I think would be um, an important aspect of, of future military sales. Um, concluding a bilateral investment agreement would be a very important step towards bringing Taiwan into TPP. Um, and finally, and I think this is an important aspect to think about, um, everyone's been talking, at least in Washington um, and Taipei, about this year being the 35th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, but this is also another, there's another anniversary happening uh, this year at the same time. Uh, this is also the 20th anniversary of the Taiwan Policy Review uh, that the Clinton administration undertook in 1994. Uh, which is a very important step in the evolution of American uh, strategy and policy towards Taiwan. Um, and I think that it may be time for another. Uh, the geopolitical context has changed significantly since 1994. The economic dynamics has changed. The military dynamics have changed radically. Um, and I think it may be time for the United States to conduct another Taiwan policy review, um, one that we could synchronize with Taiwan uh, to make sure that 
the uh, arms cooperation, the, the military strategies that we implement, the economic strategies are something that is both, that is implementable and attractive uh, on the strategic side, on the political side, um, and in a budgetary sense, both here in Washington and in Taipei. So, thank you. All right, uh, thanks Abe, thanks everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and ask the first question or two before we open it up. Um, something that almost all of you touched on, or everybody but Abe, really. You all, uh, Jim and Derek and, and Julia, you mentioned new potential partners for the United States um, and, and in various contexts. Jim, in, in the context of, of enhancing their security, uh, Derek economically, and Julia, in the, I think, in um, Taiwan's ability to engage in civil, um, civil rights promotion, not only at home but, but abroad, and bring its own democratic experience to countries that are still developing in that way. Um, and there are countries in Southeast Asia which perhaps would make uh, uh, good targets for enhanced partnerships in all those realms. So uh, this question is for everybody. Do you think that Taiwan is, is thinking strategically about, about this, about the various facets of um, improving these relationships and perhaps doing so in a, in a strategic way? Um, and, and two, is there a role for the United States to play um, in, in helping Taiwan pursue um, more normalized uh, or enhanced relationships with, with some of its partners in the region. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, you know, there are people from from my experiences. There are several people in Taiwan um, at, at high levels of government, in academia, in the in the military, um, in. The, uh, ec in the economic and trade sectors who are thinking very strategically about this and recognize the need for Taiwan to diversify its relationships, um, to, build, to uh, build more relationships with new partners and across all, all sorts of different issues. Um, the challenge is getting it through a democratic political system uh, in which there are fairly uh, entrenched interests against these sorts of structural reforms and, and uh, these sorts of moves. Um, so the challenge, I think, is for those who are thinking strategically in the sense of, of moving forward um, on these issues, and I do think that the U.S. can help with that. Um, in my conversations that I've had in around Southeast Asia and South Asia, um, when we do talk about Taiwan, um, there is a palpable sense of concern in these countries that engaging Taiwan would, would anger Beijing and, and disrupt that relationship. Um, and China is a very important relationship to them for geographical, for economic, for st uh, geopolitical, strategic reasons. Um, and I think the United States plays an important role in demonstrating um, to countries around the world that you can have a good relationship with both Taiwan and Beijing. Um, and that in some ways, maintaining a good relationship with Taiwan is an important aspect of maintaining a robust relationship with China. Um, so I think talking about that dynamic and explaining how it works from our perspective um, could help allay some concerns in the region about um, growing their relationship with Taiwan. Well, since you mentioned political and civil rights, I guess I'll focus specifically on that. I think there are two main points to consider here. Uh, first of all, I think sometimes in the United States we tend to forget what a young democracy Taiwan is. You look at Taiwan and South Korea that democratized around the same time, and they're both still working to fully consolidate their democracies. This isn't a process that's been completed, and I think a lot of people forget that and tend to get frustrated when we see backsliding or problems, whether it's in media bias or um, certain civil rights or, you know, different areas. Um, so that's a process that really needs to occur at home, and I think the U.S. could do a lot to try and work with Taiwan to promote positive change, be a supportive partner, um, and remind all elements of society that um, that although the country has come a long way since the days of the White Terror, uh, there's still a lot more that can be done to protect people's rights. But the second point is that, yes, 
there have been a lot of people, various organizations in Taiwan that have been working to promote uh, democracy development in other countries in Asia. Uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy has done a lot of work there. Um, although they're currently facing some challenges, I think there are certain people in Taiwan who are worried about um, speaking out too loudly. Uh, you know, I know nowadays certain people, for example, don't want TFD to um, promote democracy in China, particularly to better Xinjiang. They think that's a little too dangerous. Um, I don't agree, but um, that is a debate going on in the human rights promotion community in Taiwan. Also, uh, Amnesty International is very active in Taiwan, and they've done a lot of good work both domestically and internationally. But certainly, I think that the people of Taiwan are very proud, and rightly so, of what they've been able to accomplish in only two, three decades. So I think there is a lot of interest in working with partners in Southeast Asia, working with uh, other Asian countries that have yet to democratize. And certainly, yes, the United States can play a very important role there because it's kind of useless if we talk all the time about our values, um, our um, interest in promoting democracy abroad if we actually don't do anything about it whatsoever. And I think there are a lot of productive ways that we can promote democracy without uh, sending troops overseas or engaging um, in, in anything in, in, the, in, um, in that area. Um, you know, you've already gotten some frustration from me about Taiwanese international economic policy. Uh, I'm far from an expert on Taiwanese domestic politics, but fortunately in this area, it doesn't matter. If you have 23 million people and no resources, you can't afford to decide, well, it's, you know, we have special interest, you know, you're fine. You're gonna be outstripped by the Koreans, outstripped by the Singaporeans, outstripped by New Zealand, outstripped by all your competitors. Taiwan has been lucky economically for decades because other, other actors have, have, have uh, and created, created the conditions that have enabled Taiwanese prosperity. That could still occur, uh, I'll get to that in a second, but it might not. What I usually hear from both sides, blue and green, about Taiwanese international economic policy is, well, it's all China, they keep us from doing anything. Evidence doesn't say that at all. Because if, you, if, you, if, you did, if that was true, you would take all the countries that China has more influence over, and you compare them to countries that China has less influence over, like the United States, like India, like Japan, and you'd see much more aggressive Taiwanese international engagement with the countries China has less influence over. But you don't. Right? So that's not true. That's an excuse that the Taiwanese government uses for not facing up to its own domestic political opposition. And again, this is not party bias. It's both parties say exactly the same thing on this score. So what's the role, so Taiwan should just be much more aggressive in international economic engagement, as I indicated, and, and the recent provocations, whether started by one side or the other, that have occurred between China and Vietnam, China and the Philippines, that creates more space for Taiwan to act uh, in the region economically. So there's a silver lining. Um, the U.S. role, as usual, is unreliable. We're either going to come to Taiwan's rescue by creating a successful dynamic Trans-Pacific Partnership that if Taiwan can make the decision to join, will solve this engagement problem, or we're gonna completely fail right, with the TPP, which is absolutely a possibility because of our own internal political weaknesses, and then Taiwan is really you know, out on its own and has a tremendous amount of work to do. Um, so I, I do think much better econ international economic engagement is possible by Taiwan, and I think that just some very weak political excuses get made. I'm, I'd be happy for someone to fight with me about that uh, in the audience. Unfortunately, I think the U.S. could uh, offer Taiwan a, a very benign and helpful international economic environment, but that's not something Taiwan can rely on. <clears throat> on the security side, it seems that there's a window of opportunity, uh, perhaps for Taiwan to pursue as uh, China's relations have worsened uh, with, with other uh, Asian states, both in Northeast as well as in Southeast Asia. Um, but it's not clear that, that Taiwan actually um, is, is uh, prepared to exploit that window of opportunity. I think there's an internal debate, uh, and there's a lot of concern, especially on the part of the ruling party, about uh, antagonizing the mainland by too aggressively uh, pursuing uh, uh, closer ties and 
and, and taking some important steps to deepen uh, particularly security relationships. Um, but one area I would highlight uh, where, where that probably would have the, the, the greatest impact would be um, the role Taiwan could play in terms of pursuing uh, uh, and, and furthering uh, codes, of, codes of maritime conduct, uh, both in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, uh, and, and promoting uh, the, the, the norms for conduct at sea, uh, as well as the role that uh, Taiwan, given its uh, maritime claims uh, and territorial disputes, the role it could play uh, in, in helping to uh, 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 address or ameliorate uh, those disputes over time, uh, essentially trilateralizing uh, the, the, um, the tensions that exist today uh, between between mainland China and uh, its maritime neighbors and Taiwan. Uh, thanks, everybody. Let's go ahead and open it up to questions. Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces here, so you're probably familiar with the AEI rules, but I'll go through them again anyway. Uh, please wait for a mic. Uh, please identify yourself, and, and please make sure your question or statement or tirade is asked in the form of a question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ken Meyer, Court World Docs. Um, I think trying to preserve the strategic balance uh, with regard to Taiwan, as Mr. Thomas suggested, is uh, dangerous. Um, that strategic balance was established over 60 years ago. Um, China has changed a lot in those 60 years, and with their growing economic power, aren't they entitled to an improved strategic position? Uh, shouldn't we make the adjustments uh, to the changed situation. You could argue that World War II was about established powers not uh, accepting the rise of uh, new economic powers, uh, and 50 to 60 million people died to, uh, to uh, stop Germany and Japan from taking their place in the sun, and what was the dominant power in Europe after the war? Germany, and in East Asia, Japan. Thanks for the question. Um, just to clarify, I was talking in terms more of the, the regional security balance rather than the, the cross-strait uh, security balance, which is obviously a, a subset of that. Um, but you know, as you know, um, I don't, no country has benefited more from the security architecture in the Asia-Pacific region, region than, than mainland China, uh, which has um, been able to prosper over the last several decades uh, in, in the architecture that, that, that exists today, today in Asia. Um, and, and I think that this is less a question for the United States than it is for the community of nations. And, and what we see is that as China has been trying to challenge the, the, the status quo and the existing security architecture, um, that really has, has come at the expense of, of its neighbors, uh, most prominently in, the, in, in terms of uh, territorial disputes in, in Southeast Asia over the South China Sea uh, and with Japan and, and the East China Sea. John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. I have a question for Derek. Derek, you were talking about um, the importance of economic policy for Taiwan, since Taiwan has no other resources. What kind of a, an economic policy are you talking about? Something that uh, Taiwan should have adopted, but hasn't. Thank you. Uh, Abe mentioned this earlier. You know, you can either do this as a domestic reform program or you can do it as a function of international agreement. Uh, for large countries, they really need to do it as a domestic reform program, but for small countries, international agreements essentially amount to domestic reform. So if, if Taiwan were implementing this itself, um, you'd look for uh, ways to improve the returns to, to, especially in the Taiwanese case, the returns to capital. You have, you have too much government involvement indirectly and directly in the capital market. Um, too much intervention, in, again, indirectly and indirectly by the central bank. Too many government-owned enterprises uh, involved in, in both borrowing and lending of various kinds. Um, I think on the labor side, Taiwan is fine. On land, Taiwan is not in great shape, but there's nothing to be done about it. I, I think continued IPR protection, I, Taiwan has done, uh, has, has started that, is crucial because small countries have to be innovative. So uh, one of the, de the debates uh, I have with my Taiwanese counterparts is, you know, you, you're criticized Taiwan too much for its IP protection and its you know, education and support of innovation. It's not that Taiwan does a bad job. It's that given its situation, it has to do a great job. It, it can't be okay. 
okay is not going to do it anymore. Uh, otherwise, Taiwan gets stuck at its income level. The way for Taiwan to get richer is to be a leading innovative country in a certain area, in certain areas, and the potential is there um, in both consumer electronics and in health. So I don't think Taiwan's in a bad job on innovation. It just has to be great in order to become wealthier, and it has done by rich country standards, and Taiwan should be counted as a rich economy now, um, uh, done a bad job on capital, capital markets. You can, the Taiwanese stock market, it's, I spent a lot of time doing that. My counterparts would not like me to use up the rest of the time lecturing you about the function of Chinese capital markets. You can do this by a TPP, if, which is, if it's a high standard agreement, is going to get a lot of these issues. But again, you can't rely on the United States to deliver TPP. We've shown that we're not reliable. Um, we might do it. That would be great. We might not. The other way to do it is to, to seek out difficult trade partners. Singapore and New Zealand are actually easy. They love free trade. Um, the challenge for me, if you're, if, you're, if you're not going to implement these reforms domestically, is for Taiwan to make deals with people who are hard to negotiate with. And boy, India comes to mind right away when you think of people who are hard to negotiate with, because that's going to require Taiwan to take strong steps on its own side. And that's really what I'm looking for in international economic negotiations. It's not the standard East Asian, and this doesn't just apply to Taiwan, it applies to lots of countries. It's not the standard East Asian fake economic agreement which is just a diplomatic agreement that ratifies existing economic ties. What I'm looking for for Taiwan to take the next step economically to at least maintain and hopefully increase its prosperity is something like uh, uh, you know, a free trade agreement with India, which would be very, very hard. But it's not, we're not trying. You know, it's, you know, there's one thing you can say, look, Taiwan's trying with six different countries. You know, something will happen. But if you don't try because it's too hard and they're a bad partner, you're not going to take that step. And, in, you know, Taiwan needs these agreements a lot, a lot more than India or Indonesia does. So it has to be Taiwan's uh, initiative. So either you can proceed dom domestically, which what I would emphasize the capital market and then certain improvements in the innovation environment, or you can proceed internationally. Um, and, you know, TPP will take care of it. International agreements, you need comprehensive agreements with difficult partners because those will embed the kind of reforms that Taiwan needs at home. Uh, David Brown from SICE. I'd like to pursue the economic thing uh, a little bit further with two questions. Uh, one to Derek, and that is that uh, the Ma administration is now trying to promote something called the Free Economic Pilot Zones uh, Program, uh, which, as I understand it, is to liberalize certain free trade areas in major cities around Taiwan uh, as a way to persuading the uh, the society as a whole of the benefits of liberalization. But uh, this program is running into opposition from uh, the DPP, in part because in opening, in making these opening gestures, they're opening to China as well as to uh, the, rest of the uh, rest of the world. I'd like your assessment of this free economic policy zone. Is it something serious uh, or not as a step towards uh, broader liberalization. And the other is a question uh, for Abe about the bilateral investment agreement. Uh, my understanding is that we've been trying to negotiate this with Taiwan for uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, that there's a new interest in it, uh, that Taiwan believes it's in a position to remove some of the obstacles that have pre prevented agreement in the past, but that USTR has limited capability to negotiate agreements and they are putting priority on, quite reasonably on bilateral investment agreements with China and Japan. And that that's what, that's a principal thing that's holding up uh, the, uh, the new agreement with Taiwan. Is that accurate in your mind? I just want to say something about the bit. It's actually worse than that. I mean, USTR isn't, isn't emphasizing the bit with China either. Um, that's just a sop to the Chinese because they got nervous about Japan joining TPP. USTR doesn't, barely has the resources to handle TPP and TTIP, much less anything else. So, I mean, this is part of my point about you don't want to be in line, you know, behind a whole bunch of countries because the United States just doesn't have the ability to admit all these countries to the TPP, even if TPP is successful. 
it's going to take a long time, as TPP is taking a long time. Same thing applies to bid. I don't mean to preempt Abe's answer. Maybe his is different. I just wanted to say that it's actually worse. Taiwan's not just behind the China bid. It's behind a whole bunch of other things that USTR is going to take a long time to get to. Now, the, the way to break through that, of course, is to be really aggressive in your bid negotiations and make it easy for the US. Um, no sign Taiwan's willing or able to do that. That gets to your zones point. Zones are this fake thing all over Asia, copying the Chinese special economic zones, which actually were meaningful because China was a you know, command economy in the 70s. When you're already a market economy, largely, these zones are a political stunt. They don't mean anything. Taiwan is a tiny little place. The whole place should be a free trade zone for Pete's sake. I'm gonna cave on a little tiny part of Taiwan to be a free trade zone. Now, someone is going to tell me I don't get Taiwanese politics, which is true because I don't care, um, and that you have to do this very, very slowly. Look, I, you know, okay, democracy tr trumps everything I say. If the people of Taiwan don't want to become more prosperous, then they don't have to. They get to express their will. But that's what's at stake here. If the international economic uh, system is reorganized either successfully by the U.S. or falls into blocks, which is a sort of long-term risk that you're, that you're seeing if, if TPP fails because the U.S. is not interested in the WTO anymore, um, and Taiwan doesn't respond effectively because of domestic opposition, it's just going to stagnate, and that's all there is to it. So I, the zones may be important politically because you have to build support, yada, yada, yada. They're not important economically. Um, they're retrograde. This is something Taiwan could have done in the 80s maybe that would mean something not now. Um, and I would, you know, my point that I pounded home and, you know, here again and again is the clock is ticking. Um, and, and if it takes a long time to build up Taiwanese domestic political support, Taiwan's going to be left behind. Real quickly on, on BIA, um, you know, just looking at your, with the caveat, if you look at my bio, I have absolutely no business commenting on trade and economic <laughs> issues. Um, so very quickly beyond what, what Derek said, my sense is um, that it's a bit of a mix of both, um, that there is a bandwidth issue at USTR um, in that it's a fairly small office and there's a lot of trade to negotiate. Um, but they have managed to do two TIFA talks um, in a fairly short period of time. So I do think that there's the interest on the USTR side. There's, I think, the bandwidth if it's needed. But I also get a sense when I talk to folks in USTR um, and talk to folks, more importantly, in Taiwan, that some of the, um, the reforms that, the ta that Taiwan would need to do uh, may be a little bit um, less easy to do than at times they've been advertised. So it, it, I think it's a little bit of, of both explanations, but overall I think the deal is there. I think it's fairly clear what it can look like, um, and it's just a matter of both sides summoning the requisite will and political capital to get there. Gerald Chandler to uh, Derek uh, Scissors primarily. Could you put uh, Taiwan in the context of other countries uh, of about the same size? Uh, suppose that Taiwan was independent and China accepted its independence and there was no uh, military problems. Uh, how does uh, Taiwan's uh, in, uh, future look in that scenario compared to Australia, which has about the same population? Uh, Holland, which has a little bit smaller population, or even th uh, uh, Thailand, which has a bigger population, which is less developed and has no particular resources. Okay, that's a really interesting question. I guess I get all the questions because I'm so controversial. Um, you know, there's no, Australia comparison doesn't work because Australia has such an, an you know, incredible resource endowment for its population. And that can be a, bless, a curse as well as a blessing, but with Chinese commodity demand, it's been this huge blessing. And arguably, uh, Australians are the richest people in the world per capita now. Um, and that won't last, but, but that's true now. Uh, we did a, a paper at AEI, or when I wasn't here, but I, I joined in the paper. And the, a good comparison might be the, the greater Seoul area which is not rich in resources, and if you, it, it turns out to have a very similar population to, to, to Taiwan. Um, and you know, if you look at the successes of the last, of the, in the post-war era, um, obviously Korea has a threat <laughs> from North Korea, rather, rather a vicious one, so you, you wouldn't necessarily 
you, you don't necessarily say, well, Taiwan is explained by China and the military problems, because the Seoul area does too. Uh, it's right on the border of uh, the demilitarized zone. And the, the two, you know, they're both excellent, superb success stories, both, again, uh, U.S. system, rise of Japan, then a lot rise of China, which helped Taiwan a little bit more than it helped Korea, but it's helped Korea a lot. Um, the difference is now, which is the Koreans are being really aggressive. They already have FTAs with both the U.S. and Europe. They're negotiating one with the Chinese. If anyone could get the Japanese to come to the table seriously, the Koreans would negotiate with them too, but, you know, good luck. Um, they can join, because of, the, because of the chorus FTA with the U.S., they can join TPP at the drop of a hat. Um, they're very aggressive in at least parts of India, the parts they've identified as being, as being valuable to them. Um, so I, I would say, if you're talking looking backward, which is why I avoided all those statistics, there's a lot of comfort Taiwan can take in looking backward, because compared to the Seoul metropolitan area, which has done very well, Taiwan has also done very well. Um, they're, they're comparable in a lot of respects, uh, both in, in their status and their performance, so that's great. But what I see from Korea is an absolute commitment to move forward, whatever the new international economic environment is. It, you know, making closer ties to the U.S., making closer ties to Europe, making closer ties to China, joining the TPP if there is a TPP. Their, their fingers are in lots of different uh, pies, and Taiwan seems still stuck on either making excuses about China or not really being committed to open trade and liberalization for domestic political reasons. So, you know, if you're talking about past performance, I didn't mean to imply that Taiwan hadn't done very well given its environment, because it has. If you're talking about future performance, I think, and, and everyone in Taiwan is obsessed with competing with Korea, they should be, because the Koreans are in a stronger position right now than the Taiwanese are. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question give you guys time to think. Um, Julia, this is just a question for you. Uh, going back to this question of potential backsliding in civil society and civil liberties in, in Taiwan, just a few months ago we saw massive protests in Taipei about the um, cross-strait uh, trade and goods agreement. You know, are there lessons to draw from the state of civil rights in, in Taiwan, the state of um, civil society, and do you expect that there will be lasting repercussions there for, for sort of the domestic political situation? Yeah, I think that's a question we've all been thinking about a lot lately, except Derek, that's okay. Derek can focus on economics. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole lot of societal discontent in Taiwan right now, and we've seen it bubbling to the surface in a number of ways. Uh, everything from the anti-nuclear protests, um, people looking at what's happened in Japan and worrying about um, the future of Taiwanese energy. We see um, people who are worried about um, LGBT issues. You know, there's recent protests in Taiwan a week or two on that. Um, the anti-media monopoly movement where I think the students actually came together quite effectively to uh, ensure that Chinese media interests didn't completely overwhelm Taiwan um, because you know, I mean, we, we have a lot of media polarization in the United States, too, but, you know, in Taiwan, we have this problem with all these advertorials. Uh, we have problems with um, certain media outlets um, increasingly afraid to say anything negative about China, anything negative about hu human rights in China, things like that. Um, but, the, yeah, the Sunflower campaign, the, the Sunflower movement was, I think, quite extraordinary, and... I think we've seen um, something quite new here that built upon the momentum of the Wild Strawberries movement back in 2008, where we had a wide spectrum of people in Taiwanese society, not necessarily uh, just the Chinese, or, t or excuse me, the, the Taiwanese, or just the mainlanders, or just the DPP, or just the KMT. I think we saw a lot of students uh, academics and people from various sectors of society really transcending uh, classic um, class barriers, ethnic barriers, political barriers, and coming together in order to try and peacefully express their, their grievances with the government. And I think, you know, it's revealed a lot of problems um, that were never fully rectified fulling the transition to democracy 
um, regarding um, legal protections, uh, legal me mechanisms by which certain agenda items are pushed through the legislature. Um, so I think there is the potential for the government to have a very healthy debate with the populace. And I think part of the problem is that certain people within the government were far too condescending, far too patronizing, and weren't willing to adequately engage with these civil society actors who, you know, I don't think had a malicious agenda. I think they did seriously want to try and help move society forward in a way where you do have a balance between very stark and important economic concerns and um, concerns about the future direction of the democracy. So I, I think if the government is willing to have a very frank, sincere dialogue with the citizenry going forward, uh, there is a lot of positive actions that can be achieved. But I think if um, these civil society groups are, are brushed aside, then that can be uh, something that can create a very serious, uh, dangerous problem in the future because, again, I think we're going to continue to have a lot of this discontent bubbling up to the surface unless, unless it is addressed. Wang from the Chinese Embassy. I have a question for Julia. Just now you mentioned that the U.S. should help Taiwan to join or become an observer of some international organization. You also mentioned about the United Nations. So my question is that the United Nations is an international organization, which you all the members are from a sovereignty country. So everybody knows that Taiwan is not a country. So China, uh, is the founding member of the United Nations since 1945. So from 1945 to 1971, it is represented by the ROC. So after 1971, so the People's Republic of China takes, it, takes the seat in the United Nations. So if you look back to the history, in the United Nations, there is only one seat for China, no matter who represents. And so my question is, so if the United wants to help Taiwan to join the U United Nations, that's a violation of the current uh, international order, and it also will challenge the charter of United Nations. So I don't know why you want to make such a suggestion. Thank you. Well, as a historian, I'm very familiar with the addresses you are addressing. I actually wasn't necessarily saying join as a full member. What I was saying was, I think there are a number of ways in which Taiwan could participate more fully, either as a full member when uh, that is a possibility, or as some type of an observer. Uh, we saw recently that um, Palestine was able to take a more active role, um, engage um, uh, or participate more fully in the United Nations. So I think there are various opportunities that could be available to Taiwan. And, you know, I don't think this should be seen as something that is meant to antagonize China. I think having participation, whether it's um, observership, whether it's membership, benefits everyone. I think there are a lot of things that Taiwan can do, um, you know, everything from contributing to discussions on pandemics, uh, discussions on um, democracy development, on, you know, there are a whole range of issues, uh, scientific expertise, where everyone will benefit and um, from Taiwan's inclusion in the dialogue. And I think we could think a lot more creatively about ways in which Taiwan can participate in various organizations. And I don't think that it's in China's best interest to try and block Taiwan entirely. I think that we really need to have much more constructive dialogue about 
ways that the country can participate. Okay, so nowadays I think if you uh, study on Taiwan or about the cross-state relations, you will notice that the government of People's Republic of China, the mainland, and the top leader, the president also shows that the Chinese uh, government uh, shows its well, uh, its goodwill for Taiwanese intention to for the international participation. We see that if the participation will not violate, will not create two Chinas or one Taiwan, one one China, that means if you are well in line with the one China policy, one China principle, so that will not be a problem. So the Chinese side will also help. Uh, Taiwanese participation. So we can also take the, I mean, last year, I mean, Taiwan uh, joined the 38th uh, assembly of the ICAO as a guest of the chairman. So that's a good example and also shows China's goodwill. So I don't understand why you suggest that you United States to help Taiwan. So the way is very clear that Taiwan can talk with, with, them, with the mainland China. So we can have a good arrangement for Taiwan's participation. And uh, I think the Chinese concern about why we need a third party to interfere with, the, uh, with, with this. Because this is an issue between the Chinese of the, on the two sides of the, of the Taiwan Straits. So I think if, the, if you let them to discuss by themselves, they can have a good arrangement. Uh, if you look back to the peaceful development of the cross-strait relations, you will see that the Chinese have the wisdom to arrange themselves. They can find a very good way. So the, Chi uh, the Chinese government is always opposed, uh, we call the foreign or external interfere with our domestic affairs. So my opinion is that if you suggest the US government to help Taiwan, so maybe the Chinese government will uh, understand it as you will in, you want to interfere with our in domestic affairs. That will make the things more complicated and it will not be helpful for Taiwan's uh, participation. I think maybe you're, you have a good intention, but at last you will find that the result is not what you want. You will do something to in fact impede Taiwan's participation. So my idea is that you should encourage Taiwan or encourage the cross-strait dialogue on Taiwan's the so-called international space. So if you suggest the US government to do something or take some steps to, as you said, you want to help Taiwan, but uh, you will find that the- Sir, do, do you the, have a question? Yeah, 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 that's a question. So I, I hope you can maybe make a comment about, uh, my question is that, you're suggesting not a good idea to help, to really help Taiwan. So the real way, I mean, I mean the, the best way is you, you should encourage Taiwan or you, you to talk with the mainland China and you should not encourage the US government to help Taiwan. So that will complicate the situation and that, that will not be helpful to Taiwan and also not helpful to US interest. So how do you comment that? Um, just two very quick points, and I think we'll move on. First of all, I don't think that ad hoc invitations are really demonstrating China's goodwill. Uh, I think that we should really decide upon something more permanent that will benefit all parties. Number two, um, the United States clearly does not see helping Taiwan as interference in Chinese internal affairs, particularly since U.S. policy is that Taiwan's future is indetermined and we do not view Taiwan as a province of China. Uh, I'm Colonel Yuan from Taiwan. <laughs> and I have a very easy question. Uh, it, it's about uh, it's about the uh, um, you know it, there's a hit debate in in, in Taiwan right now. It's about 
the uh, we're going to set up a negotiation uh, uh, mechanism uh, about the trade uh, about a trade uh, a trade trade agreement uh, even uh, even before any tree, any kind of a trade uh, trade agreement be initiated. We're going to give the authority to the, the legislative UN and to, to have them say yes or no uh, about any future or trade agreement with the foreign countries. So I want to ask, ask the Derek about what's your opinion on that and any uh, suggestion to give the Taiwan government. Thank you. Yeah, I'll restate what I said before. Um, the democratic will of the Taiwanese people trumps economic advisors. I mean, you know, I, what Taiwan's people want is what they should get. That's why we value democracy. I don't have the time or the interest to become an expert on Taiwanese politics and how these things should proceed and you know, wh the, the, whether the administration was not honest, ent entirely honest with, with its promises on trade negotiations. What I'll say is Taiwan cannot afford economically to fight long domestic political battles, whatever the reason is, whether it's justified the opposition to current policy is justified or whether it's not justified because it will be left behind by countries that have already resolved this problem. South Korean students are not known for their reticence and their meek acceptance of government policies. And yet, South Korea has managed to move forward here. Part of that, and we lack this in the United States too, I do not mean to be pointing my finger only at Taiwan. Part of that is leadership from the top, sustained leadership bipartisan or multipartisan leadership where, some, where, where it is pointed out that free exchange benefits societies. And if whatever policies need to be adopted to compensate uh, those who don't do as well under free exchange, you adopt them. Um, if you don't have leadership from the top, if you're paralyzed by domestic political infighting, you get left behind. So I can't really effectively comment about the, I mean, I know the issue, but I don't have an opinion on who's right because it's a political issue. What matters is that Taiwan needs to resolve these things one way or another, with an agreement between the two parties, with an agreement between the administration and the legislative one. However, it's done, because other countries have resolved them, and they, and they will continue to move forward. And Taiwan, because we don't have a Japan or a China's rise to boost Taiwan automatically, Taiwan is taking a big risk not being aggressive in international economic negotiations. Hi, uh, my name is Gloria. I'm from TechCrow, the Taiwanese Embassy. I have a question for App, or p uh, perhaps from uh, others uh, welcomed. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this year also marks the 20th anniversary for the um, Taiwan policy review done by the uh, Clinton administration. So I wonder if, and you said it's time for another one, and I think that's a brilliant suggestion. So uh, do you have like any concrete um, examples of how we can do it again, like um, maybe relax the uh, restriction for the high level of government official to visit DC or I mean make a cabinet level visit, a regular visit, things like that. Thank you. Sure. Um, and I, I what I was trying to say, I don't know if I actually said it that way or not, um, was just to raise the question of whether it's time. I think it may be, um, and I think it's certainly worth a discussion um, within the, the U.S. Uh, policy community about whether it's time um, to take another look at, at this document. It's, um, you know, 1994 um, was, was a time where our relationship um, post, uh, post the transfer of, of recognition was about 20 years old, roughly. Um, and so we're, we're about, it, it's, it's a bit of an old document. Um, and it may be time to take a look at it. Um, some, I think that there's a lot of different areas that would be worth looking at, including visits um, and the, the level that is allowed on both officials coming here um, and, and U.S. officials going there. Um, other aspects being looking at um, the dynamics of our military relationship um, and making sure that our strategies um, and our ends, ways, and means are, are aligned um, and realistic from a political and budgetary uh, standpoint. Um, um, also look at looking at further integrating our trade relationship and economic relationship as part of our overall uh, our overall relationship I think is, is would be an important part to look at. So yeah, I think that there's a lot of different issues that, that um, 
should be taken into account. Uh, and I'm not saying explicitly uh, that yes, this is something that we should do and this is what we should do, um, but I think it'd be a good topic, uh, a good question for us to ask and to think about um, in, the, in the coming year. Yeah, I, I, one, just really, one point really quickly. I, I agree with Abe, and I think we have been taking some steps to try and think about ways in which we can move forward. And I think the attempt to create a Taiwan Policy Act in Congress uh, was, was quite useful in that it addressed a lot of these issues. It was thinking about how to um, engage in more high-level exchanges, thinking about how to... Uh, improve certain aspects of our defense or economic relationships. So, yes, I mean, whether we go the legislative route or whether we do a policy review, I think that we should at least be thinking about how to move forward and how to make a relationship more productive. Uh, David Brown again. Uh, I'd like to put in a word of caution about the idea of having another review. I think one of the secrets of how to improve U.S. relations with Taiwan is to do it quietly in a way that does not either give the PRC leverage to resist what you're doing or to make a big issue in U.S.-China relations. If you look at what's happened over the last 20 years since that reform, quite a number of things have been done quietly to improve the relationship without provoking problems uh, with our partners in China. And uh, I think that's the way to move ahead. And progress has been made uh, both in the military side of things, uh, in the visit side of things, uh, with respect to Twin Oaks, uh, other ways uh, with, without complicating our relations with China. Thank you. John Zayan with CTI TV of Taiwan again. Uh, question for Jim. Um, on security matters, um, is there a role for Taiwan, I mean practical um, a role for Taiwan to play in the uh, U.S. rebalance strategy? Because uh, um, Taiwan has actually uh, raised this possibility, but so far we haven't seen anything um, concrete. <clears throat> I think in, in terms of rebalancing, I mean, the greatest contribution Taiwan could make uh, would be to um, reevaluate and, and, and uh, in, intensify its, its efforts at its, its own defense. Uh, how, how does it maintain uh, a reasonable self-defense? Uh, where there's such an asymmetry or a, a disparity of power across the strait. Um, you, you, there's no question. You're never going to have parity. You're never going to have um, anything remotely like a cross-strait uh, reasonable balance. Um, but is Taiwan taking minimalist steps uh, that would enhance uh, crisis stability and deterrence? And can that serve as a backstop for continued improvements in, in the political and economic cross-strait relations? All right, well, oh, okay, we'll take one more question. Iris Shaw uh, of Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. Uh, can I just make a clarification of party's position? Um, um, we do not oppose free trade. Uh, uh, you may see all this media report about DPP legislature filibustering. What the point we are making is that uh, we we are pushing for a more holistic legal environment and and the structural reform um, in accordance with um, the uh, free trade, uh, the liberalization of the market. I think these two have to go hand in hand to make. Uh, is successful. In a matter, as a matter of fact, uh, the DPP has sent delegation to Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia um, to study uh, how they um, proceed uh, all this um, necessary industrial um, uh, reform to uh, help 
Taiwan to join the TPP, and we have asked Ma government to uh, uh, shorten the, the time he promised from 10 years. Uh, to, so um, I, this is the clarification I need to make. Thank you. I know you chose this wording um, just to make a point, and I don't mean to pick on you for it, but I think it's absolutely apropos. The DPP and the KMT, too, do not oppose free trade. I think that's really the message you get constantly from the two parties. That that's not what an island with 23 million people and no resources should be doing. Not not opposing free trade. It should be embracing, and that's really my the point of my criticism. If politically it's impossible in Taiwan to move past not opposed to free trade, then you're at a, a big disadvantage against your competitors in the region. All right. Well, uh, please. Join me in thanking our panelists, and, and thank you for, for coming listening this morning.